<laughs> you think it'd be easy. Walking, I mean. You just put one foot in front of the other over and over again. Add a little balance. I don't know. I guess when you break it down, there's more to it than just mechanics. It might even start with trust, you know? Is my foot going to land right? Will I turn my ankle? Will I fall? And when I fall, are people going to laugh at me and point, hey, look, they fell again? Or will they help me up? You know, we spent so much time crawling or even just laying around. It seems it's safer to just stick with what we know, right? I don't know, though. There's just something that compels us to learn to walk. And something so beautiful about watching someone overcome the struggles and finally get it. When it becomes natural to them, you know? I mean, sure, they still have to look out for ditches and holes they could fall into. But they learn how to avoid those, too, I guess. Yeah, it's got to be worth the risk, the challenge of walking. It's like we were made to walk or something, maybe even run. I wonder if any of us would have ever even gotten off the ground without someone there to help us out. Just a thought. Because you have eaten poorly over the last several days, we're going to burn some extra calories. I'm going to invite you to stand as I read God's word from Ephesians chapter 5. The word of God says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Fragrant offering, sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for at one time you were in you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in that which is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of your time, because the days are evil. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, I'm going to be seated again today, too. Now, this Christian life, one, one of the favorite ways the Bible talks about living this life is it is your walk with God. And it's, uh, it's not a sprint. It's a journey of millions of steps. Uh, Eugene Peterson went to be with the Lord this year. He, he had that expression, coined that expression, it's a, it's a long obedience in the same direction. Uh, one of my favorite ways to think about the Christian life, a long obedience in the same direction. Year after year, day after day, we put one foot in front of the other. We flee the wreckage caused by sin and we follow Jesus on this path of life. We step away from selfishness toward love. We, we move from darkness to light. We step away from the foolishness of a broken world into the wisdom of God step by step by step. One of our, one of our favorite ways here at our church to talk about what it means to be a disciple, to grow as a disciple, to develop as a disciple, is a disciple is someone who's always not only taking a next step, but seeing beyond to the, to the next steps that are yet before them. 
Here's what happens. Unless every so often we just stop and we look back and see where we've been and we, we vision forward to see where we're headed, what happens is our feet just gradually drift off the path. We lose our way. And it's like a hiker who, if you don't check a compass, you're traveling a long way through a fairly remote wilderness area, even a few degrees off. And it doesn't take long until you're a long way from where you ever intended to be. So slowly, subtly, without even noticing, you can, you can exit the, the narrow path that leads to life and you find yourself on the superhighway of, uh, of darkness that leads to death and destruction. I think after 30-something years of full-time ministry, one of the things that at this stage of ministry in the various places I've served and the people I have known in ministry, one of the things that most breaks my heart is... I know too many people who once were faithful to the Lord, faithful to the church, faithful to their families, faithful to the kingdom of God work. And if, if someone's just known them for the last few years, they, they probably wouldn't identify that person as a, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, as a believer in Jesus Christ. Because there's nothing about their life today that, that even gives evidence of, of that relationship. And here's the thing about those people. They didn't w just wake up one day and say, I think I'm just going to go nuts. I, I think I am going to take off on a path that leads away from God and destruction. It was, it was just missing the course corrections. And one small step in the wrong direction became another, became another, became another, until one day... They find themselves a long way from the cross of Christ. Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 2. For if, having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things, defeated, the last state's worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit and a washed sow returns to wallowing in the mud. The Bible is so awesomely graphic in how it describes things. But that's a great description of what it means. Follow the Lord and then one day, just a long way from God. This thing of walking with God is, is, a, is a good way for me to think about the Christian life, and I hope that you'll embrace it. Ephesians 5, in those first 12 verses, uses that phrasing uh, frequently. But you can go all the way back to I believe, Genesis 5, where there's Enoch. Enoch's one of those uh, ancient, uh, ancient followers of the Lord. And here's what it says about Enoch. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and the Lord took him. It's not like... He got old and got sick, and then he died. God just, God just said, I think I just want that guy with me. And he took him. Enoch walked with God. Noah is described as a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time and his generation. He walked faithfully with God. Micah, the Old Testament prophet, gives us a great uh, picture of what it means to belong to God, walk in relationship to God. He says, mankind... He's told each of you what's good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. And walking with God is not something that's reserved for this precious small few in the world, but this is what it means to have a relationship to God, to be one of His children. You walk with Him. Uh, what happens when you walk with someone? Uh, Rhonda and I... Uh, when we were in our dating relationship and early in marriage, we, we ran together. We quit that foolishness a good while back, and for, for which I'm grateful. Uh, we've, uh, we, ce we, ce we celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary a couple days ago. And, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. All that applause is for Rhonda for doing that. Um, and... Uh, but we enjoy walking. Now, we, I mentioned before that 
uh, Rhonda has convinced me to uh, a, a night person to become a morning person. This, this transition occurred years ago. And she turned me into this. And so we're at the gym at five o'clock in the morning and we do our thing and then we go home and I cry the rest of the day. But I'm, I'm healthy, uh, just very sad. Uh, <laughs> but in the, when, when we get to time change, we like walking in the evenings. One of my favorite things is, is walking together and uh, partly because it gets away from the TV and gets away from, uh, you know, we may have a phone that's just telling us how fast we're going, what our pace is, and how far we've gone, but uh, phones are away, and walking together is one of my favorite things, because it gets us away from distractions, and we have wonderful walking trails in, here in the city, and uh, it, as long as you don't get run over by somebody going 40 miles an hour on a bicycle on that walking trail, you'll be okay, but to walk together, when we get away from the house, and get out, it's just a great time to catch up on what's really going on in our lives, to share heart stuff, uh, hopes, dreams, past, future. We, we laugh a lot. Uh, it's, it's, now, there's still distractions. There are people, and there are, we got nature. I love, we love walking outside in the nature. You see flowers, you see trees, you see wildlife. Uh, you're chased by coyotes, apparently, in Collin County now. You go out and, uh, but, but it's just, those, those distractions are just something you share together. You point out as you go through your walk. And so I, lo I love walking with Rhonda. Walk, a walk with God is a lot like that. It's clearing out some of the debris and the distraction and just focusing on the things that, focusing on one another and they're sharing back and forth and they're just, you're doing this journey together and you make observations and you talk about the things that are important to you and you share your heart, you seek to please Him. That's what walking with God is and it just becomes your focus. And meeting with Him is not this activity that's just reserved for uh, Sunday, okay, it's Sunday at 9 o'clock, 10.30, and check, and I got that done. I can go on about my business for the rest of the week. You don't have to worry about that. That's, that's not what walking with God is. It means that we're in fellowship with Him. Uh, A.W. Tozer said the goal of the Christian life is to live in a state of unbroken worship. And, and that idea of unbroken worship doesn't mean you're sitting in a pew holding a songbook or you're all facing forward, that's, that's not, what, uh, not what it means. It, it means that you are, you're walking with Him through life. And that's true on a Sunday as you worship. It's true on a Monday as you dive back into the workplace or school or whatever your day holds for you. You walk with God. Now, walking with God requires saying no to many other things. Uh, We've uh, gone out to eat a few times recently and watched, you've done this too, families that they're all sitting at a table together with their phones. They're not talking to one another, not getting to know each other better, but uh, they're uh, all doing private phone time. There are plenty of distractions in your relationship to God too that can just pop up, that can squeeze out your time with, with God and If, uh, if, if I went walking with Rhonda and, uh, and, and I was just on my phone the whole time, it wouldn't be pleasing to her. I wouldn't get much out of that relationship either. Putting away a distraction is a key part of that. And here's what happens. Uh, there are a lot of things that become that kind of distraction or relationship to God. And it's habits. It's sin. Uh, you know, worldly pleasures entertainments, uh, unhealthy relationships. And these, a lot of people who belong to Jesus, they know it's not God's will for them. They know it's what God created them for. But, but yet, they pretend it is all just fine because we self-identify. I'm a faithful Christian because I give God 1% of my life. And that's not what it means to walk with God. It's bigger, it's better than that. To walk with God means you and God are in agreement about your life. Not 
Walking with God means God's in agreement with how you're charting the course. But that, but that you're in agreement with how God is charting the course for your life. We are walking with God. This image of relationship to God is a walk through life. It carries over into the New Testament uh, too. Peter wrote in 1 Peter, this is one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. Not just walking, walking with him, but your steps land the way his steps land. Your heart is with his heart. Your mind is with his mind. And you are together in how you see the world. The new year is a good time for course correction. And we'll do some new year's things next Sunday. Uh, which uh, the sermon is uh, something like, please discard your luggage, I think is the uh, title of the sermon next week. You have to figure that out for yourself. But this image of a walk with God, uh, this is a time to take out the map, to look back a little bit, to look at your compass, to look at Paul's command uh, from verse 15. Look carefully how you walk. Examine closely this walk that you're on with God. And so we want to do a little of that today. In Ephesians, Paul commands his readers five different times something about walking with the Lord. He says, walk in good works, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And in this passage, you walk in love, you walk in light, you walk in wisdom. And those are the three things we want to unpack this morning. We're going to look backward, look forward. And we're going to try to figure out, okay, where have I drifted off of the path? What steps do I need to take this year to get back on the path? Recognizing God is here to help me do just that. I want to follow Jesus down these uh, sometimes hard but blessed roads that he would take me down. Here's the first thing, to walk in love. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. So for Jesus, what does love look like? Well, it, love looks like nails in his hands and feet and a spear in his side and, and a terrible death on a cross and carrying on himself the sins of the world for all time. Uh, love, love looks like sacrifice. If you're going to get good at love... If uh, you're going to walk in love as Christ has provided an example, it's going to cost you some things. Love always costs. It's going to cost you some it's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some convenience, going to cost you some comfort, going to take you outside of you. It's a messy world out there and you start sharing love and being a person of Christ-like love. There's be some things that get laid aside to make room for that. This is a love uh, of Jesus breathed life into dead spirits, dead hearts. Love that, uh, here in Ephesians, how deep, how wide, how long, how high is the love of Christ. Oh, deeper, wider than the galaxies. Love that washed away sin from our soul. Love that God commands us to imitate even if our strongest love is just a, a, a flicker compared to the, the radiance of the love of Christ. You start there. Walk in love. What does that mean to you? Uh, for a lot of us, I think walking in love means you, you, you go low to lift others up. Spend your time with people who are lonely, who are grieving, who are broken. Meet needs. Be God's presence with people around you. Fix your attention on the people that everyone else is forgetting. Uh, there, there are a lot of people nobody else is going to care about unless God's people care about them. And one of, one of my prayers in my, my prayer journal, Lord, help me to love the people nobody else cares about. Uh, that love will cost us, and we're going to have to relinquish some things. But in the end, he more than pays back anything you're going to give up in sacrifice. The Bible says it this way in Ephesians 6. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a bondservant or free. So when we look at Jesus, we see this example of love. 
There are two characteristics about his love, how he loves, how he calls us to love, that are going to be really important. And I talked about this some last week because it, it keeps people stuck more than just about anything else. We'll probably touch on it a little bit next week for this same reason. Because we're free in Christ and yet we become slaves to, to certain things. We, we, we are bond servants of, of rotten stuff. And if we're going to love like Jesus, we're going to have to learn to forgive. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Uh, we forgive because he forgave us a lot. And in all our relationships, in the hardest of our relationships, we're going to have to learn to be forgivers. There's a great misunderstanding about forgiveness, and that is that for, if I forgive them, somebody, and a lot of us, you quickly say, oh, here's somebody who wronged me. Here's some, it, it's that, that person they used to work for or work with really just stabbing the back on something. It's... Uh, It's the neighbor who always blows his leaves into your yard. It's, uh, it, there, there are a thousand different levels of it, but we hang on to things so, so tightly. Things where we think someone did us wrong, took advantage of us. And we think that forgiveness is, well, I have to make excuses for a person that hurt me. No, you don't have to make excuses for them because they hurt you. Well, it's not a really big deal. No, it probably was a big deal. If you're still thinking about it today, and some of these things are years ago for some of us, if you're still thinking about it today, it's a big deal. And Well, I, I'm letting them off the hook. Well, it's not up to you to let anybody on or off a hook. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is letting go of your pain, letting go of your right to get even, and why in the world would you do that? Why, why would you forgive somebody? You do it for your sake. Not, forgiveness is never about the other person. It's not, not, not a gift you're giving them. Forgiveness is a gift you're giving yourself. To say, I'm not going to carry this into 2019. I, I, I've, I've carried a bitterness, an anger, a frustration with somebody for years maybe. And why would you want to keep doing that to yourself? Why would you let them continue to control something in you? To, to continue to dominate a piece of your heart that, that is free in Christ. Why would you want to do that? Forgiveness is a gift you bring to your own life. So in the year ahead, why would you want to carry over bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness? You lay it aside and you are free in Christ. Walk into the new year without carrying that burden another step. The second characteristic of love Ephesians 5, 2 uh, is wrapped around sacrifice. Christ gave himself as a living sacrifice. Again, love is just going to cost, and, and it's going to cost you more than sentimental uh, Hallmark card feelings. Love's a lot bigger than that. The Bible does never describe love as a feeling. Love is always an action. It's something that you do. It's a response to need. It's a response to people around you that's grace-filled. John wrote, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. What will sacrificial love look like in 2019? What, not, not just love, like, oh, I want to try to get along best I can. What does sacrificial love look like in your family, in, in your workplace, the people you're going to, in your circles of influence, in, with your friends, in your church this year, we go low in love so Christ can lift us up. We can experience the joy that is ours in Him and joy in this life. Walk in love this year. Second thing, walk in light. Verse 8, at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Paul gives examples in this passage, two different spots, examples of the darkness in our world. And there's no doubt about it. It's a dark world. And there is a lot of brokenness in, in this old world that we live in. And uh, in the walk, as you walk through life, sometimes you say, what? Ah, darkness has reached out and grabbed my hand to walk with me. Uh, it, it'll lay hold of you in the, in the middle of the walk. And if you're playing with the darkness of sin, it is a dangerous thing. If you think that you can walk with sin, 
brokenness, darkness, and it not affect you and not pull you away from God. You're deceived. John takes the idea of walking with God in his light uh, an extra step in 1 John 1. He says, if we say, this is a sobering verse, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Man, that's rough. It's not as rough as what the message uh, paraphrase did with it. Uh, there it says, if we claim that we experienced a shared life with him and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. Uh, to, to, to focus this thought, the Bible says you can't walk with God and walk with sin at the same time. We think we can I'm walking with God, but I'm holding on to these areas of darkness. And I'm comfortable with disobedience and rebellion against God and doing exactly what this book tells me I should not do and not doing the things this book tells me I should do. And I can hold those things in balance, in tandem, and my life can still be pleasing to God. And the Bible just says, that is not so. This is serious. Walk in light. When the light of Christ breaks into your life, he makes the darkness flee and he shines into, into the dark corners of us. The God of light made you a child of light, lit by the radiance of Christ. Therefore, walk in light. And it does come to us that we have some responsibility in this as God is, God's making himself readily available for this purpose, but we have to, we have to work with him. He, God's at work in you, and we work uh, with Him to accomplish this purpose. This, again, it's a walk, hand in hand. It's a, a partnership as we get those dark spots driving out the shadows from our soul. You have to train your, your mouth to build people up instead of to tear, tearing people down. We, see, we live in such a harsh world, and uh, social media has given us a lot more opportunity to do it somewhat more anonymously and it's easy to punch in uh, some really harsh things about everything imaginable or everyone imaginable and uh, feel okay about it you're going to have to train yourself to build up not cut up to to just love purity more than more than the sin that is around us. And sometimes it seems attractive. It seems to yell louder. It seems to shine brighter. And yet it leads us into a darkness. And then grow in gratitude. Paul, here in this passage, he talks about Thanksgiving. That we should become ever more thankful for all God has done for us instead of regularly listing. Here are all the deficits of where God came up short today. Where God's coming up short in my wish list. My Christmas list didn't all get met, not just in presents under a tree, but in relationships and all those things, and I'm angry about it. Ephesians 5, 9, ache for all that is good and right and true. You can walk in these paths of light this year because you're already light in the Lord. You know, the dark version of you died. If you belong to Jesus, you've given your heart to Jesus, I encourage you, if you haven't done that, don't finish 2018 without saying yes to Jesus. I'm going to turn from my sin, believe Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead, and I am going to commit my life, to surrender my life to Jesus. Make that commitment because the light comes to shine in your heart. And Jesus talked, Matthew 13, shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father. And that transformation happens as you step out of the shadows, as you repent of the specific darkness that has a grip on you. Is maybe you confess your sins to the Lord, confess your sins to one another so somebody's holding you accountable. And shine the light of God's word into the dark places of your life because it illuminates uh, the dark places. Walk in light this year. And then the third thing is to walk in wisdom. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Look carefully. From the ESV means uh, circumspectly, uh, carefully, thoughtfully, cautiously. 
the wise walk is an intentional walk. You make the most of your time because it is short. Time is short. This life, you live a long time in this world. It's just a blip on the screen of time. Uh, the days are short. The days are evil. So make the most of your time. Lean into God's will because he won't lead you astray and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the gift we have, the down payment uh, for, uh, in our salvation that God offers up. Why not be filled with the Holy Spirit? And here's why, and by the way, how, how are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Every time you say no to sin and yes to God, the Holy Spirit is going to get a little stronger in you. Every time you open this book, that's why we're encouraging you, read your Bible. We have multiple Bible reading plans available on the website. We have some hard copies back here at the desk. Get into God's Word every day because every time I read God's Word, the Holy Spirit is stronger in me and I'm better protected in a broken world and I'm better focused in a, in a sinful world in which I live. Every time you spend time in prayer, every time you are in community fellowship with other believers, every time you take the time, energy, and giftedness that God has entrusted to you to serve other people in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit just gets stronger in you. You keep all those things in place, moving you forward. This is going to be a good year for you, and it is a wise way to live. Here's why you need to do that. Because in this walk through this world, one of the things that we're going to find is that every walk is going to take you through the devil's backyard. This world is a broken world, and you can love Jesus with all your heart and do all the right things. You're going to walk through some dangerous places because Satan, Satan is active. He's, a, he's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, the Bible says, and he'll pick you off, especially if you're in isolation from Christian community. If you're not spending time in God's Word, not spending time in prayer, you're not active in, in uh, service in God's kingdom work, he, he'll, he'll pick you off. And the farther away you get from the light, and the farther away you get from His love, the, the more vulnerable you become. It is an evil age, an age where the devil stalks the earth. In Ephesians 6, we're going to get that he's, uh, he's got some flaming darts He's firing away. And if we don't apply God's wisdom to how we're walking every day, Satan is more than glad to give you advice on how you ought to walk. So walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Seize your days from the devil's hand. Uh, the clutch he has on your life. And you need to make plans for this. But wisdom is to, is to focus this. What, what, what plan do you have for, to make your marriage everything God intends for it to be in 2019? you're married what what plan do you have to to be the kind of parent you need to be whatever age your children what, what kind of plan do you have for your friendships in this year what kind of plan are you making uh, for for life and ask in this part of my life whatever segment, wherever your circle of influence, in this part of my life, how can I live like Christ is precious? The gospel is powerful. The Holy Spirit of God is inside of me and eternity is before me. How can I live with that vision for my life every day? Christ precious, the gospel powerful, the Spirit inside me, eternity before me. God has already broken the devil's power over you as a believer in Christ he's handed you a shield of faith to extinguish those flaming arrows I mentioned he's given you the sword the word of God to go on the offensive against the enemy these days may be evil but how about this you don't have to be no part of you has to be so with a lot of careful looking the Holy Spirit's help Make the best use of evil days and walk in wisdom this year. Some of you are afraid to go outside now because it's evil out there, right? There are all kinds of bad things just looking to grab you. And, uh, you know, there's coming a day, there's coming a day when you don't have to worry about those things anymore. Uh, 
there's coming a day, and I pray it would be soon, when you don't have to look carefully always how you walk, like walking through your house in the dark with knowing that your child got a big bag of Legos for Christmas. You, you don't have to worry about, those, about the dangers of the world because perfect love, God's perfect love is going to course through your veins. And because the light of God's righteousness just radiates through you and around you all the time and the wisdom of God is on you and you know as you are known. But until that day, 2019 is in front of us. Another year to look carefully how you walk. Walk in love. Go low to lift others up. Walk in the light and just be intentional about driving the shadows from your soul and walk in wisdom. We say, I'm going to seize the day from the devil's hand. And if you'll do those three things, there, you start experiencing some of heaven here and one day to be with him forever in a perfect place with his perfect love and perfect light and perfect wisdom and the culmination of millions of steps that lead to glory. Let's live this 2019. Live it well.